A very special guest in our studios, the former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. His brand new book, a fascinating tale called The Menzies Era, The Years That Shaped Modern Australia. It's published by HarperCollins and I'm delighted to say the former Prime Minister, John Howard, is in our studios. Mr Howard, good morning. Hello, Stuart. Good to be with you. Thank you very much for being here. It's an historic book in itself, given it's a book about the longest serving Prime Minister of this country, written by the second longest serving Prime Minister of this country. <laughs> Yes, that's uh, one of the reasons that I decided to write it. It was when you've been Prime Minister yourself, you can bring a perspective to the narrative of an earlier Prime Minister that nobody else can. Yes. You can understand some of the pressures, you can understand some of the considerations, the context. And throughout the book, um, to add to the narrative, I inject, some of my own judgments and make the observation, well, I did, did or didn't agree with it. The, the book is complimentary about Menzies because he was a towering, successful, dominant figure who dominated an era in Australian politics in a way that nobody else has. But it's not a hagiography. Right. And at various stages I express a view that I wouldn't have done that or I thought such and such was not the smartest thing to do. But it was an a period that really did lay the foundations of modern Australia, the the huge middle class, which is a characteristic of this country, although it's under a, a bit of attack and erosion at present, the, the good life that came to a large swag of Australia for the first time in the 20th century in the 1950s and 60s, all of those things were products of the Menzies years. Now, like every Prime Minister before and since, he can't claim credit for all of the good things that happened any more than he's to blame for some of the bad <laughs> things that happened but uh, you are responsible for a lot of it and he is entitled to be seen as the architect of the foundations of modern Australia uh, architect of modern Australia and that's uh, the conclusion I come to having uh, written the book I went into it with a knowledge of him yes but the additional research and so forth um confirm that view. Uh, it's interesting as well because there are some parallels for you obviously those torrid years in opposition you went back and forwards contesting an election you and Andrew Peacock went back and forth he had that uh, that period for a couple of years that uh, was in many respects you look back wholly unsuccessful compared to what would follow all of those years later and of course in your own way to go on to become the second longest serving Prime Minister was a testament, I suppose, to both of you, strengths of, of will and persistence in the world of politics. Yes, he certainly had a big fall. He had a rapid rise. He was Prime Minister only five years after he entered Federal Parliament, mm. although he'd had a period of years and rising to be Deputy Premier uh, in the Victorian Government, in the Victorian Parliament, and he becomes Prime Minister in 1939 after the death of Joe Lyons. And uh, within, when the war breaks out, it's a grim time to be Prime Minister. Mm. And two and a half years later, he senses he no longer has the support of his colleagues, and he didn't. They deserted him in droves, mm. including Harold Holt, incidentally, who later became his deputy. They all left him. And uh, so he gives the, the job up and within 40 days uh, John Curtin becomes Prime Minister, not through an election but because the two independents holding the balance of power transfer their allegiance from Fadden, who'd briefly replaced Menzies, to Curtin. And people then think Menzies is finished, mm. but he's not. And he, um, uh, within a short period of time, he's asked back to become leader of the opposition and he says that um, he will take it on condition that he can set about forming a new anti-Labor party. And he does that, and the party he forms is the Liberal Party of oh. Australia, which, measured by winning elections, has been the most successful political party Australia's ever seen, and, of course, a party that I had the huge privilege of leading for 16 years. What kept you going through all of those difficult times? Well, because times? I wanted to do things, uh, even when... I'd been removed from the leadership of the opposition in 1989. I stayed in politics because I was interested in issues. There's no point in being in public life unless you want to affect beneficial change or defend uh, uh, an existing arrangement against unreasonable attempts to demolish it. You've got to have a cause. You've got to have a goal, not just 
the sake of being in office. There's yes. nothing to be achieved by that. And people have this strange idea that just being in office is some kind of end in itself. It's yes. not. Yep. You've got to be doing things. Mm. I know people said to me after we lost in 2007, oh, you shouldn't have done this or you mm. shouldn't have done that. And I said, well, I did it because I believed in it. And if it, in the end it means that you are thrown out of government, well, that is the nature of the democratic process. Is the debate on big issues harder to have in this country, do you think, at the moment? There's a lot of negativity, a lot of scare campaigns. We saw it with you with work choices. Mm. We saw it with your introduction of the GST. Mm. We've seen it with the carbon tax. On both sides, there's been a lot of scare campaigns. Run. Does it make it tougher now for us to have a... Tony Abbott's calling for a mature debate on the Federation. Has it become almost impossible for that to happen in the current political climate, do you think? It's always been hard. All of the reforms that I brought in were opposed by the Labor Party. Mm. The only period in which significant reforms were introduced and they weren't in the main opposed by the opposition was when Hawke was Prime Minister and, and I was either the leader or yep. deputy leader and yep. I supported it. Yes. I mean, something like the reintroduction effectively of university fees, I supported that. Uh, and we rarely opposed any of his uh, uh, cost-cutting measures in budgets. We supported his reduction in tariffs. We supported uh, his uh, float of the dollar, all of those things. We supported. And in that sense, it was easier for reform to be implemented at that time. By contrast, when I became Prime Minister, we got no support from the opposition on anything. Yes. We had to cobble together support from the crossbenchers and the independents in the Senate. And if it hadn't have been for the willingness of Meg Lees after the 1998 election to negotiate with the government about the GST, for which the Australian public had voted, and the Australian public in 1998 voted for a GST yep. which covered fresh food. Yes. It was had a to more comprehensive... Yeah, than what we and, have and, today. And, and, and if that had been passed by the parliament, we would not be having the same agonised debate that we're having at the present mm. time because the GST would be a much bigger revenue raiser and, and the states would not be as um, uh, short of cash. I think the states do have a... They'll always be short of they, cash. Yeah, well, they'll always <laughs> be short right. of cash and they'll always say they'll they're always short of cash. Exactly. Right. I understand all of that. I understand all of that. But they do have a genuine complaint Yes, because yeah. the GST was... Whole, the proceeds were wholly given to them and that was fine until the GF global financial crisis came along and people cut back spending on yes. all the non-essentials and the big thing they didn't cut back spending on, of course, was food because it's an essential. And, and, uh, it escapes the, the GST. It, it escapes it? the yeah. GST. So that had a big impact on the state's uh, revenue yield. Negotiating with Meg Lees was one thing. How do you think you go with Clive Palmer? Oh, Clive Palmer at heart is not a Labor man. He's not. I mean, no. I'd rather negotiate with Clive Palmer than the Greens. <laughs> yes. I mean, the Greens are way out on the left of the Labor Party. And the Greens, in the time I was Prime Minister, I don't think the Greens, they weren't as big a force right at the beginning, but they grew. Yes. I can't remember them supporting me on any policy no. issue. But they were even more opposed to what I wanted to do in the Labor Party. Well, it's hard to believe. I mean, today the fuel excise is now going up by well, almost half a percent. I can't understand. I thought she was in favour of well, zero fuel. This, this, I thought, this, is, I thought, the, I thought, this is the point. I, you I, would I, have thought... thought. She, she's gone back and forward since the announcement was first made in, in the May budget and the Greens seems to have waxed and waned on this one. When you look back on it and the flat Tony Abbott's now copping today, the broken promise and everything else, do you think it was a mistake at the time for you to freeze the indexation back when you... No, it wasn't. Um, context is everything. The circumstances back in 2001 were different. Uh, people felt that in the introduction of the GST that there hadn't been full enough compensation through a reduction in excise for the imposition of the GST. Now, that was only a valid complaint in a, in a tiny, almost artificial way because there had been a big cut in the excise, but that was the perception that people had. And I felt that in order to overcome that perception, a dramatic gesture was needed from the government and that dramatic gesture was to cut the uh, amount of the excise and also cancel the automatic indexation. And this was a time when petrol prices were rising. Yes. Whereas petrol prices are probably tending down now because there's a, 
an over not an oversupply, but there there are plentiful supplies of fuel. So I think uh, the circumstances are entirely different, and clearly um, it makes no sense given the avowedly pro conservation stance of the Greens. It yes. makes no sense <laughs> at all for the Greens to oppose. Uh, the in- introduction of the reintroduction of the automatic indexation and the method which is being used, and that is to apply it subject to ratifying legislation in 12 months' time. That's that's a, a decades old uh, methodology of dealing with excise changes. There's nothing new or conspiratorial or revolutionary or wicked about that. It's something that's happened on numerous occasions in the past. It's just that most of the other changes in the past have not been as high-profile high as this. As a significant political figure yourself, how did you feel being booed as you entered that memorial service last week? For Cof- well, I was Cof- hardly Cof- conscious of it. There, was, there weren't any. I didn't uh, mind. There were, I think there were a few boos outside, but that's almost a badge of honour. I think a lot of the people outside were treated it as a Labor Party rally rather than a memorial service. Mm. And it was a bit. Mm. That's right. Jackie Kelly, uh, who was one of your favourites when you were mm. in office, she was uh, elected uh, by the Howard Battlers, that, uh, that seat of Lindsay. Yeah. She contested uh, state pre-selection mm. in that seat of Penrith against the sitting member, Stuart Ayres. She lost. She's now declared at the weekend she'll run as an independent. She's left the Liberal Party. You a bit disappointed in all of that? Yeah, I am. I like Jackie. I still do. Uh, I'm sorry that... She's seen fit to leave the party because she was a great candidate. She was something of an emblem. Uh, in 1996, we won the seat of Lindsay, which is, includes areas like St Mary's and foothills of the Blue Mountains, Emu Plains. We won it with a 12.5% swing. And I thought on that night, gee, the world has changed when you've got St Mary's represented in the federal parliament by a Liberal. And she held it. Uh, at a by-election with the increased majority and then held it again in 1998 and then she retired before the 2007 election and we lost it in that election but, of course, have now won it back. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I just uh, hope that uh, she might think further of what she's decided to do. I'm not going to attack her. There's nothing to be achieved by that and... And uh, if she's listening to this uh, interview, <laughs> she may be or maybe not. I just hope she might reconsider it because you still have a lot of friends in the Liberal Party, Jackie, who admired what you did. And I hope you might think better of it. And, and uh, the area's got a good member. He's a minister. He's had a fairly rapid promotion and, and those things don't happen unless people have got merit. Jackie had a fairly rapid promotion. I made her a minister... After the 1998 election, she'd only been in Parliament for a couple of years, so she was well treated. Uh, Given you've written this book on Sir Robert Menzies, given your own time in the job, what's the part of the job you don't miss? I don't think there's any part of it I don't miss. People often say to me, do you miss it? And I say, yes, I do. It's disingenuous to pretend you don't miss it, but I've adjusted. Uh, the the key thing when you leave politics, or at least you, (laughs) it happened with me, (laughs) In uh, is that you have to adjust. You have to accept that it's over, but you don't lose interest. I'm still intensely interested in politics. I, I don't say a lot. I'm saying a bit now because I've got this book to promote. Yes. And uh, uh, but I think Tony Abbott is doing a fantastic job. And the the best way that I can help Tony Abbott is to um, uh, be very careful and selective in what I say because inevitably people look for differences. Tony Abbott w- will run his government differently from the way I ran mine. We were both Liberals, we're good friends, very close friends, but he's different, he's got a different style, he's younger, he brings a different approach and people shouldn't be surprised uh, that he might do things a little differently from the way I did them just because we're in the same party, just as Hawke did things very differently from the way Whitlam did. Yes. Uh, very differently. Uh, Tell me this, because uh, you think now back on your career and all that you've done, you say you you miss nothing. In the lead-up to 2007... No, when I say miss nothing, I mean, in a sense, I miss everything. You miss everything, sorry. There's nothing I don't don't miss, miss but I've adjusted, yes. In the lead-up to 2007, we know how much political polling is is done. At, At what point did you feel we're losing the election and at what point did you feel I'm losing my seat as well? Oh, I knew from the time 
the, the general polls turned against us about a year out that my own seat was in danger because my seat had been made marginal mm. by redistribution. All the very strong Liberal bits had been shifted out of it places uh, over the years, places like Lane Cove and Longerville and Hunters Hill and so forth. Found they were, their way to North uh, Sydney. North Sydney. You know, yeah. you know, that's, that, there was nothing wrong, there was nothing um, irregular or improper about that. It was just a shift of population. Yep. And my electorate got pushed westward. And I knew that sitting on a margin of only 4% or 4.1%, that my seat was a marginal seat, and that's what happened. I just copped the the swing. There was a swing in New South Wales of 5%, and my seat went with it. And then, of course, at the next election, uh, it was one back. So, so as I jokingly say to people, the Liberal Party finally found a good candidate to bet on, (laughs) and uh, that's why they won the seat back. And and they've held... And he's... uh, Alexander. John Alexander is doing a great job. He's a very popular member. But it's a more marginal seat now. When I won it way back in 1974, it was, although not the very safest Liberal seat on the North Shore, it was a safe, essentially North Shore-based seat. Now, that changed over the years. That happens in politics, and I held it for 33 years. You did well. You've certainly had some career. There's no doubt about that. Uh, The second longest-serving Prime Minister of the country has written a book about the longest-serving Prime Minister of the country. It's put together by John Howard. It's called The Menzies Era, The Years That Shaped Modern Australia. It's published through HarperCollins. And former Prime Minister John Howard, thank you very much for your time this morning. Nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. John Howard.